This video is brought to you by Movie, a curated streaming service that premieres a new film every day. What are the worst movie and TV cliches you can think of? It's a little obvious, don't you think? Okay, but here's the twist. Whether it's the escalating misunderstandings that could easily be cleared up if someone just explained, the action hero effortlessly walking away from serious crashes and outrunning explosions, the off-screen gunshot that turns the tides, or the woman throwing up as the only way people ever apparently discover they're pregnant. Allison just puked. Dude, that's what I said. She's probably pregnant. So often, stories resort to lazy, easy shortcuts we've seen a million times before. When are they effective or timeless? And when is this just a boring lack of imagination? Here are some of our favorite or least favorite movie cliches. Well then, kiss me quick before you wake up. Why is it that characters are always just about to kiss, only to be interrupted? Sometimes the distraction is something catastrophic. Not bad at all. Other times, the characters themselves just can't handle the romantic tension. What papers? A big romantic kiss is seen as the end of an arc for characters, so it can't happen too early, and writers are often scrambling for reasons to delay this moment. This is spiritually related to the will-they-won't-they, they, where characters with obvious romantic chemistry on a TV show are kept apart in order to keep audiences coming back. <sighs> this can't be it. It's a cliché, but an undeniably effective one. If Sam and Diane, or Ross and Rachel, or Jim and Pam fully get together, it takes some of the air out of the show. Even if we don't admit it, we'd rather see Jim and Pam pining for each other, or Sam and Diane fighting. I've never met an intelligent woman that I'd want to date. On behalf of the intelligent women around the world, <laughs> may I just say... If there's one thing we've learned from TV and movies, it's that there's strength in numbers, but groups of people facing an unknown threat so often decide to split up into pairs or lone individuals. I think we better split up. So it'll probably go faster if we split up. Let's split up! This cliche exists not to show how people would reasonably react in a horror movie situation. Would your first instinct be to go off by yourself? It's just an easy setup for attacks as members of the party are picked off one by one for dramatic effect. This trope has become so prevalent that it's been widely mocked. How come every time some scary shit happen that we need to stick together? You white people always say let's split up! And most characters in action and horror movies are now entirely aware of it. First of all, there's enough horror movies now you don't split up when you're in a big, scary asylum. The Cabin in the Woods explicitly includes this in its satire of horror movie tropes. The group initially wants to stay together. We've got to play it safe. No matter what happens, we have to stay together. But the scientists manipulating the group simply use subliminal messaging and mind-altering drugs to drive them to the conclusion demanded by the genre. This isn't right. We should split up. We can cover more ground that way. Taking off glasses to make someone hotter is one of the oddest cliches of visual media. If someone wears glasses, it's a shorthand that they must be an incorrigible nerd and incapable of attracting a partner. No, anyone but her. She's got glasses and a ponytail. But once the glasses come off, it's a whole new ball game. This trope includes characters like the Princess Diaries Mia, who literally transforms into a princess. She's All That's Lainey, an unpopular kid who stuns the cool kids at school with her beauty as soon as her glasses are removed. And Scooby-Doo's Velma, who does a lightning-fast makeover in order to win over a guy. Who's your mommy? It's not just women. Historically, the character Superman uses thick glasses to maintain his civilian identity of Clark Kent. Because there's no way that anyone, even intrepid reporter Lois Lane, would think that the bumbling, bespectacled Clark Kent could be Superman. I'm really... I mean, I, I was, uh, at first, really nervous about tonight. The Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies use Peter Parker's glasses to communicate whether Peter has his powers or not, since getting bit by a radioactive spider cures his weak vision and makes him stronger and more confident. Strangely, many movie and TV characters seem unable to recognize a person if they're wearing glasses. Do me a favor and take off your glasses. Supergirl. A variation on this trope is the countless times in movies when characters toy with sunglasses to emphasize their hotness or coolness. 
If Hollywood cliches really turn you off, look no further than Mubi, a streaming service where every movie is handpicked by their team of curators to bring you the very best of cinema. In September, you can find yourself watching the extraordinary short film Hideous, a collaboration between the XX's Oliver Sim and Knife and Heart's Jan Gonzalez. It's a haunting queer horror musical in three parts and a Mubi exclusive. Another exclusive premiere coming this month is Ricky D'Ambrose's beautifully shot second feature, The Cathedral. Grappling with issues of class and politics through the lens of a single family, it gives a snapshot into American life in the 90s and early 2000s. I love Mubi because there's always a really exciting range of things to watch, and as one of our followers, you can get 30 days of Mubi for free. Just click the link in the description below to start streaming now. Mubi has pushed me out of my comfort zone and broadened my tastes, and because I know that everything on there is carefully curated, I can trust whatever I choose to stream is going to be compelling. I'm so grateful for all the fascinating films I've seen as a result. Click the link in the description below to get 30 days of movie now. A professional begrudgingly agrees to do one last job before they retire, and you just know something major is going to go wrong. They might be an assassin, a soldier, or a thief, the crew of The Italian Job, or Robert De Niro as aging criminal Neil McCauley in Heat, or really any of a number of Robert De Niro roles. Because after this, no more jobs. This is the last one I'm doing. I'm quitting. This trope sets up emotional character stakes. If the protagonist can simply get this one job done, they'll get to live happily ever after. Your grandchildren, they're waiting for their father to come back home. And this job, this last job, that's how I get there. In these movies, getting to retire is also a stand-in for redemption, for earning their way out of a life involving violence or deception. You've done a man's job, sir. I guess you're through, huh? Finished. But the one last job trope has been done enough times that it feels hollow. It's easily mocked in characters like 24's Jack Bauer or the Fast and the Furious's Dominic Toretto, for whom every job is seemingly the last one, but who must keep coming back for additional seasons or sequels. Here we go again. Again. The suspiciously convenient news piece is one of numerous movie tropes that exist because of the need to provide exposition. Once again, Sarah Connor, 35, mother of two, brutally shot to death in her home this afternoon. In this clip from The Terminator, the news broadcast is used to communicate that someone is murdering people named Sarah Connor, setting up the threat to our Sarah Connor. In some cases, the coincidental broadcast conveys information to the characters right at a critical moment, like in Watchmen when Ozymandias is able to prove that his plan to create a tentative world peace worked. Another ultimate weapon? You could say that. Eventually, this cliché became prominent enough that a comedy like Arrested Development could mock just how contrived it is for the exact right news segment to come on at the exact right moment. And imagine the impact if that had come on right when we turned on the TV. How does technology work again? Even to this day, plenty of movies fall back on the old saw that just typing away at a few keys is enough to do basically anything. What are you doing? I'm taking over a TV network. In this cliche, hacking is basically the same thing as casting a spell. You just have to be one of those techie magicians who knows all the secrets. It's a unit system. I know this. On one hand, it makes sense that this is such a trope. As science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke famously wrote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. But in a world where technology is increasingly omnipresent and we're all aware of how incredibly complicated it is, we're still getting scenes like the fate of the Furious' is car hacking, where a bit of typing can take over a fleet of cars. Hack them all. By contrast, it's far more interesting when films and shows go the opposite direction. Silicon Valley's send-up of the modern tech world finds humor in just how hard and time-consuming it is to bring new tech into the world, and also underlined how important it is to consider the consequences. Ultimately, this will mean the end of privacy. Electrical grids, financial institutions, the nuclear launch codes for every single nuclear weapon, all will be exposed. So what's the cliché that most annoys you? The way every character's home is impossibly clean, and parents always have time to prepare a picturesque breakfast for their children while being all ready for work? How no one ever says goodbye on the phone and kids are like impossibly clever mini-adults? That's so hacky! Let us know which clichés you think we should make a video on next. I bet you never saw this coming.
Oh, hi, friends. This is The Take on all of your favorite movies, TV shows, and pop culture. Don't forget to subscribe. And ring the bell for notifications. We're going to need a bigger screen.